Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Indian Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, IOHNS, I welcome you all to this, uh, this, this, to this CME webinar series, which has been continuing. This is the 10th in the episode, 10th, 10th episode in this series called the GSK IOHNS webinar series on contemporary ENT practice. And today we have uh, a discussion on thyroid. The topic is holistic approach in the management of thyroid disorder. We have Dr. the endocrine surgeon from CMC Velour, who will deliver a talk on locally advanced thyroid disease. And the moderator of this uh, panel, which will follow, is by Professor Dr. Madan Kapri, sir, from Nagpur. Recording in progress. A very well known name in ENT, all of India and abroad. He has a number of uh, accolades. He has uh, worked very intensively in the uh, rural areas as well, and his work on tobacco awareness, uh, awareness regarding tobacco um, cessation and its harmful effects have won him a lot of uh, I mean, popularity. Sir has been one of the pioneers in thyroid cancer surgery in India. And actually, when we talk about thyroid, his name immediately crops up. I hand over the microphone to Professor Madan Kapresa to introduce Dr. M. J. Pal. Thank you, everyone. So you're muted, sir. Sir, you are muted. And uh, you can, uh, if the connection is very weak, your video, you can just uh, switch on. Close down, sir. Just give, give, give me a minute, give me, can, can, can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Okay, fine, that's better now, much better. I think Vijay sir's net is a little unstable. We may put up the slide of Dr. M. J. Pal. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. I think if uh, Madan Kapre sir's net is slow, can you introduce Pal sir and can you start the lecture? Yes, I think we will go ahead. Uh, by the time Madan Kapre sir's net is uh, So are you back, sir? Yeah, I'm back, but uh, yeah, without the video, it's okay, sir. So your your voice is clear, so we can go ahead now. Okay, that's that's good. Then. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just start off because then uh, by the time uh, uh, Professor Paul finishes his talk, I could be uh, back with my new connectivity. The weather is very bad over here. It's uh, cats and dog raining, so we're losing the connection time and again. So if you can hear me, uh, I will introduce this talk. Uh, of uh, Professor Paul. Uh, as you know, Professor Paul is a professor of endocrine surgery from CMC Vellore, and he specializes uh, especially in endocrine and breast. Uh, he has lots of work uh, with his original interest in thyroid and also the minimal invasive surgery for parathyroid and thyroid itself. Uh, he also, as his talk will continue, will, uh, will be aware that his uh, also interested in advanced diseases because not many people will venture into uh, uh, thyroid cancer when it becomes little advanced. He has many awards and honors uh, 
uh, he is Linnaeus Palm visiting teacher at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Uh, he is a very good combination of Obama seeing grand bioethics uh, at Boston. And then, of course, there are some guests oration to his credit, Professor Krishnamurti oration, Professor K.D. Verma oration, and also at the international level like UK uh, Breast Forum in 2021. A very illustrious person and the department that he comes from, I am very impressed by the simple numbers of things they are doing over there because one of his colleagues, Deepak, is a very close friend and I keep hearing and we try to emulate what goes on in Vellore in our institute. So that will speak a uh, volume about what uh, respect I have for the Vellore Institute uh, and Professor Paul and the team in particular. So with this little introduction, I will request Dr. Uh, Professor Paul to start his talk on a keynote address on management of advanced thyroid cancers. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for this inconvenience of connectivity, but I'm sure uh, we'll try to uh, sort of uh, get connected pretty soon on a different module. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to hearing Professor Paul. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I hope you can all hear me. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Kapri, it's my honor to be introduced by you. And uh, thank you to the IOHNS uh, team, Dr. Vijay especially, who has invited me to deliver this. And it is an area that I have been interested in for a while. And I think it should be of use to the ENT surgeons who are dealing and the NNX surgeons dealing with these kind of tumors. So locally advanced thyroid cancer. Um, uh, is the topic for today. I'll just sh shortly give a few pictures. This is the CMC hospital uh, view from the hill next to it. And you can see the whole of Willow. I'm interested in this kind of photography. And then the buildings, the new campus is just started uh, close by for the specialty departments. These are the mentors I have to give a credit to, Dr. A.S. Fenn, who started interest in this work, thyroid, famous thyroid surgeon, and Dr. Arvind and I are my mentor and boss of yesteryear. My whole team, including Deepak, Anish, Sean, and Dr. Supriya, all of them, without whom I cannot present this. So with that, I'll move quickly to the topic. I would like to first state that locally invasive disease can be divided into three categories. Uh, the central axis, which includes the trachea, larynx, esophagus, and the laryngeal nerves. The lateral area, which includes the carotid sheath with the artery, IJV, as well as the lateral nerves. And the mediastinum, where the grape vessels uh, of the thorax are of interest. So the first, the thyroid cancer with aerodigestive tract or central invasion is an uncommon problem, which is why there is not a lot of experience uh, to deal with this and different ways of dealing with it. So in this uh, textbook um, of endocrine surgery, which has collated 18 series of 10,000 patients, they reported 6% was the incidence of aerodigestive tract invasion. It is, although uncommon, the commonest cause of death in thyroid cancer. And that is why this topic is interest, uh, interest to us. It's a life-saving procedure. So aerodigestive tract invasion alone was the cause of death in 35% of thyroid cancer deaths and associated with metastasis in a further 28%. Um, this was from Kitamura's paper at 99. The Markens group uh, from Netherlands who put together this data showed the areas of involvement, which are the structures that are invaded. We have the strap muscles most common at 53, the recurrent nerve at 47%, the trachea is next at 37, and then we have the esophagus, larynx, and other sites. So we can see the strap muscle, of course, is not of much concern because it can be easily resected. The main Concerning areas are the recurrent nerve, the trachea, esophagus, the larynx in the aerodigestive area. So the principles would be based, uh, the surgical in intervention would be based on life expectancy. So short-term maintenance of speech, breathing and swallowing function is of critical importance and a long-term goal of disease control in the local regional area. 
we can use external beam RT or non-surgical management options and consider new adjuvant TKI or reduce the tumor to make it more operable or even chemo radiation in some settings. And this decision obviously is best made in a multidisciplinary team where we get the input from the radiation and oncology colleagues before we take this decision, including a detailed discussion of appropriate imaging, uh, usually the CT scan or MRI with our radiology colleagues. Now, this is a very famous picture of the stages of tracheal invasion and comes from uh, the Grillo group in the US. Shin was the first author of this publication, so it's called the Shin staging. Uh, the pathological staining of papillary carcinoma with airway invasion. So you have basically four stages. And I've written below the image what appropriate surgery can be done depending on the level or depth of invasion. So you can see in image one, stage one, there is carcinoma, which is coming from the thyroid and invading superficially onto the trachea. This is the cartilage, which is not, it is just on the superficial aspect of the cartilage. So this will be managed by just a shave. You can get gross and possibly microscopic control, uh, which can be handled with simple techniques like iodine therapy. In stage two, you can see now the cancer has invaded into the uh, body of the trachea and there are grooves between the uh, cartilages. So they, that's where they extend between the tracheal cartilage rings and come into the uh, main body of the tracheal wall. So here, even if we shave it, some microscopic disease or mild gross disease is left and will definitely require uh, external beam radiation. Some, depending on the depth, would even resect trachea for this stage two. That is still uh, an option. But when it is stage three or four, where the tumor has gone through full thickness, come submucosally, or has broken through the mucosa and can be seen uh, endoscopically in the lumen, then definitely uh, this one should be resected. So I think this gives a clear picture of how to manage. In the past, uh, unfortunately, most surgeons would use shave and RT for even stage three and four, and that led to poor outcomes. So that is now shown that these need to be managed by resection. So to shave or to resect, again, just a recap, superficial shave, intraluminal resection is required. <clears throat> the controversy is where stage two of varying depth, and that needs uh, proper assessment by uh, CT and bronchoscopy to tell us what is the actual depth and the intraoperative decision. Now, here's an example. A 58-year-old female recently came with noisy breathing. That was the only first symptom. And that is the tragedy. Many of these, they remain very asymptomatic till they actually invade and cause respiratory symptoms. And there, on examination, there was a three centimeter fixed hard lump um, arising from the thyroid in the thyroid region. And you can see here the CT showing intraluminal diseases. And the cartilage is seen as this white line. So if this is uh, definitely stage three or four, it will be confirmed on uh, bronchoscopy. So bronchoscopy, it was stage four. This is how it appears at surgery. So here we've actually got the patient uh, uh, in uh, the regular thyroid surgical position, this to my left is the superior, right is inferior, and we are looking from the right lateral aspect, and the ET tube is seen in the trachea. The tumor is here in the wall, so we have identified the invaded area and resected the trachea. You can see there is a margin superiorly and inferiorly, and this is the intraluminal tumor. This is the first tracheal ring and the cricoid. So here we have good um, uh, a gap to do a, a simple tracheal resection. This image shows post resection. We have both the ends. And what we do is we actually intubate the lower uh, end with an, a, a, a tube in the field and then perform the anastomosis. Usually, what we find is about four centimeters can be resected without too much trouble in doing an anastomosis. Here's the anastomosis um, where the 
upper and lower ends are joined by interrupted sutures. Uh, Vicryl can be used, absorbable. Uh, we sometimes use a, a silk suture to provide a buttressing force from the tracheal cartilage to the trachea below, but not all are required. Now, one, this is a view uh, before and after a section. This is from a publication by Lin. You can see the luminal bulge here, and this is the anastomosis after the section. So it heals very well, trachea being well vascularized. Uh, the, the blood supply to the trachea comes from the posterior lateral aspect. And therefore, when we mobilize, uh, we need to uh, mobilize anterior, anteriorly. Now the mobilization has two techniques. One is called the Montgomery and the other is the Dido. The Montgomery procedure where we actually cut uh, the larynx uh, above uh, the hyoid and then drop the whole larynx. And the Dido where we cut the thyrohyoid muscle and drop only the uh, thyroid cartilage and the larynx component. Um, one minute, let me just see. Yeah, sorry, I don't have that picture, so I'll just describe it. So we have found by experience that uh, the Montgomery is probably an overkill. It has a lot of pain and side effects. So we do the Dido drop where we just divide the uh, thyrohyoid muscle. And with the inferior mobilization of the trachea from mediastinum, as well as the drop, you can actually cover four centimeters reasonably easily. And most of these tumors do not uh, in our experience, none of them have been more than four centimeters uh, involvement of the uh, trachea. Now, if the tumor is invading the uh, larynx, uh, for the cricoid, part of the cricoid can also be removed with the trachea, and you can anastomose the lower end of the trachea to the cricoid cartilage. We, the cricotracheal uh, resections have also been described. You can do partial. Uh, laryngectomies. I think that some of you all will be familiar than me. But if the larynx is involved to an extent where you cannot uh, perform an anastomosis or you're going to remove the arachnoids and there won't be any voice function, then uh, a total laryngectomy, as in this case, it was a recurrent poorly differentiated carcinoma invading the larynx with a permanent tracheostomy was done. So you can see this is the specimen where the Cancer has invaded the entire larynx. And this is uh, post resection. This is the pharyngeal wall that has been closed. And this is the specimen uh, photograph showing the tumor has involved the cord right in the larynx. Happy with the uh, thumb, so even though it looks very uh, aggressive. Now we looked at how experience we had uh, 22 cases where 19 were tracheal resections and uh, three were laryngectomies. Uh, this was published in IGSO recently. We had to perform a stenotomy in two cases. Uh, the mean tracheal length was 2.9 centimeters and it varied from 1.7 to 5 centimeters or up to 5 centimeters. Esophageal involvement was also there in four cases, which required uh, local resection and anastomosis. That is usually not a problem because it's only a focal involvement. And these are the maneuvers to release the tracheal length. As I said, we did only one case of suprahyoid, which is the Montgomery drop, but infrahyoid release is our standard procedure. Most of them, 10 out of 19. Some did not require any release procedure. There was enough uh, mobilization without muscle release. Postoperatively, uh, we had temporary cord palsy uh, in five cases. Uh, we had temporary hypocalcemia in 27%, permanent in four, wound hematoma in 4%. And the next question is, traditionally, we have used what is called a chin to manubrium stitch to prevent uh, extension in the postoperative period. And uh, that was, I had some input from a colleague in Geneva who 
uh, said that in the pediatric cases, they had stopped doing that and found that it didn't make a difference. Uh, and so in adults as well, we have stopped doing this stitch. The patients have naturally go into a sort of spasm and they don't, uh, have, we've never had a problem with that. So we, but that is uh, the surgeon's choice about that, whether to put the stitch or not. So you can see early in our experience, we did uh, six out of 19 had the stitch. After that, we have used it and there's been no problem. Now, when to extubate is the next question. Immediate post-op we managed in half the cases, 54%. Or the next morning, if it's been a long procedure, 45% uh, were extubated the next day. And we didn't have to do a tracheostomy in any of this series. Uh, the first, in fact, right now we have a patient who's operated last uh, a week and unfortunately it developed a small anastomotic leak and I had to go back and put in a tracheostomy. He's still in the ward. So that was the first one we actually had a problem. Otherwise, the anastomosis is very hardy and uh, survives well. The next uh, topic is the carotid invasion. Now, thyroid cancer can go laterally <coughs> into the carotid, and this was a sort of case that really changed our practice. You can see. This patient was seen at uh, a major center and the neck was opened and uh, decided that it is inoperable. They just did a biopsy. He's just 12 years old. He came with this large mass. And you can see it actually is bilateral tumor. And then on the left side, it's completely 360 degree encasement of the carotid, which is slightly narrower than the right fellow carotid. So there's a compression of the carotid and complete uh, surrounding. He also had a right uh, a left cord palsy. Uh, the right nerve was still functioning. So when he came, um, you can see the coronal view where there is narrowing of the carotid. But on on uh, detailed imaging, we we found that there was no irregularity. So we decided to go in with the standby of vascular surgeons in, in case we needed the vascular uh, reconstruction. And uh, fortunately, we managed to actually. Uh, remove the tumor completely. You can see here intraoperatively with uh, sternotomy, the tumor was uh, invading the trachea superficially but could be shaved off. And uh, the next picture will show how we have dissected. We, we cut the tumor anteriorly like a book and opened it onto the carotid sheath. And here we are going into the subadventitial plane. So the tumor some can be resected with subadventitial dissection. And the carotid here is completely freed of the tumor. You can see there is narrowing, but the uh, in tumor and media are intact. So the left nerve was anyway involved, uh, not functioning, was sacrificed. We left tumor on the right side, uh, which was completely engulfing the right nerve and closed. And fortunately, uh, this boy is, uh, he allowed me to share this picture is now seven years following this procedure. He had external beam radiation to control the residual tumor. And now he's a college student and uh, almost a normal voice. It's an amazing recovery. So we just wanted to share this as, you know, the, the kind of uh, miracles that can be done when we choose appropriately when to uh, be aggressive on these tumors. So uh, this was published as well um, about how you can do this at sub ventral dissection. Always have your vascular colleagues on standby. We have performed uh, one um, anastomo uh, reconstruction of uh, carotid. Um, and in fact, that one had a blowout and we had to stent it post-op, but still uh, patient survived. So uh, these are challenging cases. The next uh, topic is about the recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion. Now, this is, of course, the one that worries us the most. Um, but we uh, refer usually to Akira Miyuchi's paper in 2009, where there's improvement in phonation after reconstruction of the laryngeal nerve. Uh, and in these are the options. You have four options. You can either transect and just re-suture primarily using either a microscope or a um, device for uh, in, magnification. Then if there is loss of length and you cannot bring it together, you need a cable plant. So we can use the ANSA, so uh, uh, ANSA cervicalis nerve, which is there on the right at the carrot sheath. And if there's no distal stump available, it's under the muscle, you can actually dissect the nerve 
and in the muscle or you can implant the ANSA into the trichothyroid. The fourth option is if the ipsilateral ANSA, people have even mobilized the opposite and brought it retrotracheal onto the uh, site. So in our experience, this is a case where you can see the first picture on the left shows the tumor invading the nerve uh, completely and uh, we have resected the component and re-sutured it directly. So, but we didn't have very good results. I mean, uh, movement is difficult, but what uh, Miyauchi says is, even if you get tone in the cord, uh, the voice will improve. So we do use it occasionally uh, when we, but often it is, uh, you know, large involvement and it's pre-operatively paralyzed. So uh, it's now rarely done, but this is an option. This is another case uh, where there is uh, multiple, you know, uh, locally advanced as well as metastatic disease. So you have a huge, uh, this, this turned out to be a Hertel cell carcinoma. Patient uh, was uh, trying an uh, alternative medicine for a long time and it grew to a large extent. And there's sternal metastasis as well as spine metastasis. So this is the level of tracheal compression and uh, the carotids are pushed laterally, but fortunately not invaded. Uh, this picture shows the thyroid and also the sternal metastasis, spine, the spine, and spine, all three. I don't know if you can make out, there is uh, thyroid here. You can see my arrow and there is, below that is the sternal metastasis and in the bone here is the uh, spinal head. So we did a combined procedure with neurosurgery and cardio and the thoracic surgeons. And here you can see the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is shown with a white arrow. It's uh, pushed laterally and saved. Um, and that is the post-operative uh, view after resection of the tumor. And the neurosurgeons did the spine as well uh, resection. So this is her. She had a tracheostomy. Unfortunately, the nerve didn't function. Because we kept her on a tracheostomy. And this is actually uh, six years following that procedure. She has now developed a brain metastasis and is undergoing uh, radiation to the brain. But given the primary presentation, uh, the fact that you can get to six years uh, life is an amazing feat. This is another very advanced case um, was presented with a large, this entire thing is papillary carcinoma. And here we have used uh, a preoperative embolization because it was quite vascular. You can see this is the embolization picture. And during embolization and post embolization, the vascularity has come down. And he also uh, is now amazingly 12 years has survived He's had two repeat operations for skin metastasis and axillary and the cervical lymph node metastasis, but still going strong and very happy. So these are the amazing uh, uh, cases that we, we have come across. Now the role of uh, adjuvant EB external beam radiation can be considered for those at high risk of local recurrence, micro and macroscopic residual disease, extrathyroid extension, an advanced nodal disease. And it's the discretion of the operating surgeon and the radiation oncologist. You have to consider the side effects, evaluate the possibility of redo surgery for a residue. And we feel that maybe there's no survival benefit. Uh, the data is still scarce, but it may alter the manner of death that at least it won't be as fixation. So local control of disease is the aim. Uh, sometimes you get these recurrent nodes. If you've done a proper thyroidectomy, but the nodes are only in the lateral group, uh, these are fit cases for what we call percutaneous ethanol injection. This is a case uh, presented with nodal disease um, following uh, thyroid, and there was no central uh, disease, so we managed uh, successfully with uh, percutaneous injection. In uh, retrospective studies, people have reported uh, good results. Uh, 93, 84% successfully ablated using one to three sessions. And mean follow up, there was only minor pain in the board, but no records. Radio frequency laser has also been tried. This is the example of one of our cases where there's percutaneous ethanol, and you can see the consistency changing with the injection.
this is an example of progressive disease in medullary thyroid cancer where there is no real role for chemotherapy. So we try these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, now there are newer drugs. We have vandetinib and cabozantinib are uh, the standard and newer ones like selpocatinib are being uh, trialed. The standard one that's available in India, which is accessible and affordable, is sorafenib. So we have used this as well. It has this classic hand and foot uh, peeling as the side effect, and the dose can be adjusted to the complications. So pre-treatment and post-treatment pictures showing the result of shrinkage with sorafenib, and uh, then the patient was amenable to surgery and that is removal of all the residual tech nodes. Um, thanks to uh, Deepak for these pictures. So I will end with that. This is the team. I would like to thank the whole team for all their valuable input and I've done. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Paul. Uh, extremely impressed. Uh, terrific series. Uh, I wish and I am so happy that I'm not living in Vellore and I'm not getting cases like the ones you are getting. I mean, actually, I'll go on a vacation when I see some of your pictures of the sternal and the spinal metastasis and I will leave the case to one of my colleagues. Uh, but very well done, very well presented series. Uh, because most of us, uh, I'm taking this opportunity because all the panelists uh, around are uh, from ENT background and they might all be doing the uh, tracheo tracheal resections uh, and therefore quite well versed with the tracheal part of the section, but they're not so well versed with the carotid and the, the sternal. So can you just please, for the sake of those who are not well versed with management of uh, carotid, and you briefly touch the esophagus, I mean, you briefly touch saying that extramural excision and that part. Uh, just on behalf of the ENT colleagues, can I put it to you as to when and how you decide what are your criteria for doing the carotid isolation and dissection? I know once you start doing it in your hands, it's great, but let the guys who are on the panel and those who are listening outside uh, be a little bit more informed when should venture out in such cases. Do you have some guidelines on that? Uh, yes, I think um, uh, to recap, basically the carotid, uh, uh, sometimes one point I'd like to make is uh, the use of the term encasement. Um, actually, the, our radiology colleagues uh, say that if it's more than 90 degree contact, they call it encasement. But the, the idea, the encasement means is complete, you know, 360 surrounding. So you have to be careful with the term that is used and you have to analyze the picture yourself. So abutting is uh, less than 90 encasement, but actually if it is um, less than 180, then usually there's no problem at all. You can just easily dissect it. The real question comes when you see this complete encirclement. Uh, and then the second question is, uh, has it narrowed the lumen? As I showed in the case that it has actually narrowed the lumen. The third question is, is there luminal irregularity? Now, luminal irregularity actually means that the tumor has gotten into the media intima layer and then will definitely require a reconstruction. And that becomes a very major procedure. So in those cases, we would probably uh, ask you to refer to a proper center. Uh, so abutment, which means uh, 90, or I would say up to 180 even, uh, you can probably handle yourself. As I said, it's just a question of getting into the sub adventitial layer of the carotid and usually just peels off. I think why this happens is because of the forceful contraction of the carotid, which is the medial and intimal layers within the adventitia. So the, the infiltration kind of comes onto the adventitia and then is prevented further because it's constantly contracting and moving. It's like a moving target, so it's difficult to pierce. So that saves the carotid for a long time. Uh, so that, that is one point to take. Uh, even, I mean, now reconstruction, of course, is very advanced and you have to have vascular colleagues on standby if there's any question. Uh, if it needs to be reconstructed or even repaired primarily at surgery. Regarding the sternal metastasis, that's another area we definitely recommend that they be removed. If, you're, if there's a sternal metastasis associated with the thyroid cancer, it can be done at the same sitting. 
uh, the question is really, do we need to reconstruct it? If it's a small defect, usually just limit it to the uh, upper manubrium. Um, you really don't need anything. You can even just put a small uh, mesh over there. Even that may not be required at times, but definitely no major uh, flap reconstruction is required for partial manubrial excisions. That is, that has been a change also in that approach, even from the plastic surgery side. Um, spinal metastasis is an area um, that if you have neurosurgical or orthopedic spine colleagues, uh, this is, again, I have not gone into the metastatic aspects, but we have had excellent results. In fact, we have just put together a series of 46 uh, spinal metastasis on thyroid cancer resected, and many of them done in combination with the thyroid. So if it is uh, possible, we even do it in the same sitting, like the case we did here. And uh, sometimes if it's very vascular and requires a lot of blood for the spine, um, the surgeons may say we'll do it staged. So you can do the spine first and then the thyroid or the thyroid first and the spine, depending on the logistics of the case. Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that should be enough. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this was a fairly advanced and elaborate uh, discussion that you had with us. Thank you very much. And I will request either Vijay or Gautam to save the question so they can probably be brought in either during the panel or maybe after the, the panel is done. So I hope you don't leave us, uh, Professor Paul, and bear with the little lesser aggressive management of thyroid diseases, which is the one which I'm going to conduct for benefit for everybody, because I'm sure the listeners uh, may not all be doing advanced thyroid cancers, they may be uh, probably enlightened and not be so fearful about the carotid. And Keshmet, I can take you for the personal note that carotid is a very robust structure, whether it is a papillary carcinoma, which is quite friendly, or even a squamous cell carcinoma, the, the carotids resist being invaded for a very long time. And you are quite safe to do some dissection on the adventitia part and get away with it. So without doing further on to the thyroid cancer, May I start sharing my screen? Vijay, is that allowed to start the panel? So, can you all uh, see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now, we already heard and uh, talked to uh, Professor Paul. So, you know all uh, what he is and what kind of a surgery he is involved in. Uh, the next in line is uh, a young and dynamic uh, uh, Rahul, Rahul uh, Modi from Mumbai. And he's a very uh, thoroughbred uh, thyroid surgeon. And he has the privilege of being trained by none other than uh, Professor Gregory Randolph at Boston. And therefore, he does, he's a combination of uh, thoroughbred and also thoroughred, and also now graduating into a thoroughly skilled thyroid surgeon. Welcome, uh, Dr. Rahul. Uh, then we have uh, the, the experience coming out of uh, now our president, Madam uh, Bharti. Uh, she's a professor in Mysore and is very much interested in thyroid surgery. Occasionally, I had her on my uh, moderating side of the panel or sometimes on the operating side. And I'm a bit worried when she asks questions because her questions are very piercing and very practical. So when it's Bharti's voice at the other end, I'm very skeptical. So I hope you'll enjoy her experience and her talk. Uh, then, of course, the Saurabh, the man from uh, Kolkata, uh, great guy, uh, very active, very energetic, 
and always willing to do things. Uh, he's changing the scene of head and neck surgery across on Calcutta. Uh, welcome, uh, Saurabh, and looking forward to listening to you too. And last but not the least is uh, Pawan from Jaipur, uh, another very thoroughbred uh, and trained person with a lot of experience. And they see similar to what you see, Paul, in uh, Vellore, all kinds of very advanced cancers in uh, Jaipur. Uh, I'm equally happy I don't live in Jaipur, uh, but he will tell you all about it uh, later on. My talk today, and I request my panelists uh, that we have in audience uh, thyroid doing ENT surgeons. We are not concentrating on the oncology. So when I was given the topic of management of uh, thyroid diseases, I selected them all. And uh, for which I'm grateful to uh, Mohan, who is like a guiding force for all of us at IOHNS. Uh, Gautam, you have heard him uh, in the beginning of the talk. He's a current president and also has a huge experience from Guwahati, Assam. And now we're going to hold a, a big uh, FHNO meet in Assam soon. Uh, Vijay, I mean, he's a meticulous guy. And one of the meetings when we talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence in medicine, uh, without, a, without a second, Mohan suggested that it should be Vijay because it's full of artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, Vijay is not in Nagpur. Otherwise, you would have helped me with the earlier problems with connectivity. Now, let's come back to the topic at hand. Uh, this is how people envisage thyroid surgery way back in 1886. Now, Samuel David Gross was no mean surgeon and he was not a timid surgeon. His reputation was that he will take out any tumor unless it is stuck to the operating table. A man who has a reputation of that sort of a thing speaks like this about thyroid surgery. Unfortunately, none of those conditions exist anymore and we have come a very long, long way. There is hardly need for any blood during any of the thyroid surgery right now. Now, few things I'll clarify. One is what is optimum surgery because that's the sort of a title I'm going to use. Uh, for various thyroid diseases that we are going to encounter. It all depends upon available expertise, your own philosophy. But the second statement, which is done by Michael, Michael O'Donnell uh, in 1997, is something I would like to shun away from, that we don't put our interest as the interest of the patient. Because we often say in the best interest of the patient, um, unfortunately, many times it is our interest. So we will we'll, we'll not get into that. Now, some language is right. Partial lobectomy, isthmusectomy, hemithyroidectomies, subtotal thyroidectomy, near total thyroidectomies, total thyroidectomy, and completion thyroidectomy. These are the kind of words we use. I think the upper half of my slide is defunct. There is nothing like partial. There is nothing like hemi. There is nothing like subtotal. There is nothing like near total. Now, we talk about lobectomy, isthmusectomy as one procedure and total thyroidectomy as a second procedure. Completion thyroidectomies is something which we will not like to get into because this is something which we need to do on hindsight because the histopathological surprises are always there. Now, unique feature on well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Something we have to understand. Everybody loves thyroid. Everybody wants to operate on thyroid. And the reason being excellent prognosis, number one. Number two, no matter what you do, half the audience will support you for what you have done and half the audience will stand up in arms and be against you. So don't worry too much. Keep reading and keep doing. Now, the work assigned to me on the diseases of the thyroid where we require surgical knife. So that cuts out all the hyper and the hypo. And also, a lot of time I'm not taken into it, the radioiodine ablation, because that is not in the area of the surgeon. So let's start with uh, simple things. And let's start here. And... The slide on the top is uh, a puberty goiter. We got different age groups here. When I start with a very simple uh, sort of a beginning by saying, uh, and I will give a choice to the senior or the junior, anybody wants to pick up, as how would you handle the girls at these different differing ages? I may say the one on the top, of course, is, as you can see, a very young girl. The one on the left bottom is a, a, a sort of a post-pubertal. And the one on the right is a uh, sort of uh, expecting the pregnancy-induced goiter. Uh, anybody wants to pick up this question? 
Or shall I say, shall we start with uh, uh, Professor uh, Varthi? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, sir. So the one, the first is with this child, and uh, we'll have to go for uh, ultrasonographic examination, and second one is the TSH, and then depending on what we get physiological goiter in this age group, then uh, we take the help of uh, either the endocrinologist we have with us or the pediatricians. And then we'll go ahead with the therapy, depending on what TSH we get and what is the ultrasonogram report we get. If at all the ultrasound says that it is just a goiter and that's it, we will not go ahead with anything. And if the TSH is normal, we'll not, uh, we keep the patient under follow-up. This is what is for this child. And the second is, this is... Uh, what age group, sir? The second uh, lady. Uh, Hello. Uh, yeah, we are listening to you. The second lady is what? The second photo is what age? The the lady on the this this particular lady. Yeah, orange. The orange uh, lady. She is a young uh, post pubertal girl, uh, not married, and uh, enlargement of thyroid. You can just notice, but she is. Worried cosmetically. So that's the thing I put that picture up on the. Yeah. On the then also, here, if the ultrasonogram shows it's just a goiter and TSH is normal, or if it is high, also, we treat them medically. We'll not do anything for her as long as it is a uh, ultrasonogram uh, shows it's a goiter's lesion. And third year, uh, in this uh, pregnant lady, if at all the ultrasonogram shows, uh, again, the same goiter, we just keep quiet. We will not, it all depends on our TSH level and the ultrasonogram report. If at all the ultrasonogram shows in any of these three, there is some suspicious. Or if the TSH is either uh, low, then our further investigation starts. Sir. If the TSH is low and our clinical uh, examination shows that the patient is thyrotoxic, like the toxicity symptoms are there, then we go for scintigraphy. Otherwise, this will suffice. And if the ultrasonogram shows a nodule within this goiter and the features of this nodule, we need to see what exactly is there. If at all, the ultrasonogram shows the nodule is something very worrisome, like you need to see um, uh, if at all it is there with the uh, something like you think of, maybe uh, you need to rule out malignancy, like the microcalcification is there, or uh, the echogenicity is altered, or the vascularity is there, or a uh, one nodule is tall, all that features, then we investigate further. So thank with you. this puberty goiter, this is what is. Sir. Well, thank you very much. You have covered practically everything. Just a few little things I wish like to ask more, a little bit more detail. Let's work backwards. Let like this lady with the pregnancy. Saurabh, at what level would you like her TSH to be? Because she might be wanting, uh, she sees uh, no matter whether first, second, third trimester, but now she's benign, she's just hyperplastic thyroid. Uh, where would you like her TSH to be at what level? It's a huge okay. range, 0.3 to 5, almost 5.5, some people say. Where would you like her to be? Would you like to be on a Whichever size, any optimal size you can recommend? Sir, uh, frankly speaking, uh, we live in uh, seldom deal with such patient other than malignancy. Okay, uh, and okay. we prefer to send them I know, to I know, I know. endocrine for better. Right. But I right. think, uh, uh, sir, uh, anything euthyroid status, I would like to. Okay. Rahul, any ideas? So, I agree with uh, Saurabh here that uh, I will take my endocrinology colleagues on board. And I think I should be comfortable with anything below five. Uh, should be okay in a pregnant lady. I don't think I would worry too much uh, about it if it is as long as it is below five. But I'll definitely take my endocrine colleagues' opinion, especially if I get something like a 5.5 or a 5.7. You know, if, we, if it's 
like about 10 so there is no question right they will be starting yeah, that's, that's clear cut yeah yeah now pawan you i'm i'm sure uh, you see these guys are very privileged i mean he is working in onco professor is professor rahul is in a corporate uh, i am in private in a uh, sort of stand alone situation and i don't have an endocrinologist any guidelines pawan where would you do i am sure you are in the same boat this is very critical because the yes. physiological goiter in children adolescent fine but the goiter in ladies who are pregnant and they come up with a neck you have to be very careful in managing their the thyroid status if you are practicing stand alone pawan any views yes so i think uh, tsa should be a bit low low normal uh so that there should be no hypothyroidism in the kid there because that will create problems with kidneyism and all and the, the maturation of brain and all those things. absolutely so, yes so, so that's, that's correct that's absolutely right you see these people should not be on a higher side of the normality they should not be on the lower side of the normality they should be somewhere around 3 or maybe around 2.5 to 3 so that the child or the baby doesn't suffer with a, a, a I mean, whatever the uh, complications of hypothyroidism in pregnancy would be uh, professor bharti made a very clear cut point about the lady on the top because that doesn't look so simple there could be a harbinger or that could be a uh, early papillary thyroid carcinoma so one makes all efforts on such hard thyroid enlargement in children because they do extremely well and it's up to us not to label them away and send them away that oh this is uh, she is getting into the age so forget mom don't do it investigate her thoroughly as much as you would as if she had a papillary ca now the my slide doesn't move stuck just a minute huh? yeah now this is another thing which we very commonly see and uh, we do not wish that this lady should come as often uh first question i will put it across to pawan how would you investigate somebody like that yes sir uh, so so in all these see. cases when i see an extra thyroid swelling there maybe even a lingual thyroid or a cyst in my uh, investigation order if i am writing usg neck i always mention please see for the normal thyroid so that to rule out an ectopic thyroid in this child. so that is something i always order to uh, to see for that perfect fna obviously usg guided fna i was i will always get after doing this baseline thing and uh, thyroid scan I, i usually don't require sir thyroid scan yes. yeah i do have limited indications for thyroid scan yeah anybody who on the on the panel would suggest that we should do a, a thyroid scan for her the radio iodine isotope i mean Or, or if, at all, if at all, as Pavan said, if our ultrasonogram reveals two, like the normal thyroid also is there, and there is something within the swelling, then you need to know which is functioning. Maybe that is the indication I can think of. Otherwise, is I mean you can see the professorial wisdom coming. She didn't stop at saying that I will do isotope. She wants to know is a functioning or non-functioning. Absolutely and precisely correct. the scans can be kept on handy for identifying the functionality of the mass because ultrasonography may only tell you the physical uh, presence or absence of the thyroid very very important that they don't actually exist but they exist functioning that's fine now the last question of course the slide shows the surgery that has been performed on her there is no stopping there uh, practical thing and this is something which i will wonder or maybe paul can come in or maybe uh even saurabh can come on to this how often do you really really see the track between the hyoid and the base of the tongue how how often you are convinced that you have taken this uh, thyroglossal cyst and the so called thyroglossal duct trunk to the foramen cecum or into the base of the tongue does it happen always can you always see it not sir no not always but not always but as a practice we always take as much as tissue possible we take right. the hyoid we take the body of the hyoid we go it i don't know whether it is the same trip going but we take a part of the supra hyoid uh, tissue always along with this uh, trip absolutely right so don't get disheartened that if you are a beginner and doing this surgeries for the first time you are okay up to going up to the body you have that you taken the body of that and suddenly it comes off 
you even don't see nothing and there is no track and and you start feeling very sorry if either quarterly other quarterly try to buzz this off try to buzz that off don't worry because there are chances that this track may be flimsy and may not be actually seen and therefore it is good if you can see it but if you don't see it don't worry too much Kapre, in fact i would say it's most often the other way around very very rarely is it actually seen as a separate track it's go see yeah. so now don't be afraid if this happens to you it has happened to paul it has happened to me it can happen to anyone lovely yes. let's so move I've on i've seen two i i seen only two cases where i could find the track there and yeah, uh, my this is so everybody data. coming with heart on their hand and getting yes. out all through the honesty yes. now let's get on the aberrant thyroid it is only recently and i will take the uh, paul i will save you for the end because this is coming to your way and sir of this is to coming to your ear uh, later i will ask you what would you have done but i had recently a case where the thyroid was absolutely normal and there was a mass on the lateral aspect of the neck which came as a papillary meds in a lymph node or papillary uh, sort of a thyroid follicular cells so i was like biased person i did a surgery which was like uh, neck on that side total thyroid surprise surprise no disease in the thyroid all that was the neck nodes then i'll come to this problem later but i want you to under to sort of a, give some guidelines on how would you investigate an aberrant thyroid any 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 plans that you will handle it like this aberrant thyroid where is it very simple i'm sure everybody will do a a scan or a iodine to know that uh, one sits in the base of the tongue and the other sits in the neck but i want to ask you a question here so far so good how would you handle if someone has the only thyroid which is sitting in the tongue let's begin with uh, saurabh how would you do handle that now don't tell me i am a onco surgeon because she will really come to you she will come I, to you is an alarm Oh, no, no. You with the so, on the back of the tongue. Yeah. So I, I can remember in one of our meeting, uh, in our uh, when I was in TMH, in one of our meeting, this was the topic of discussion that if you find that there there is one lingual uh, thyroid, and if you find that there is a papillary thyroid cancer, so what will you do? but uh, frankly speaking that if no 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 is, wait 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 uh, saurav this is not malignant no 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 i am not i am i am not going into that i just you yeah, told yeah. me that I, uh, so uh, if there is a uh, you told that there is a lingual thyroid and this is the only functional thyroid am i right yeah so we have to see how big is it we have to do a scan we have to see how big is it and if it is a small one and if it is a, means uh, patient is in uh, means you thyroid state or something like that probably i will not uh, touch it immediately but if it is big enough if it is causing problem if it is uh, uh, if it is uh, causing uh, difficulty in deglutition maybe if it is that big difficulty in uh, in uh, means a respiratory problem then we have to address it otherwise i don't think i will touch it anybody in the panel who has uh, access to the robot and who has got access to the robotic uh, midline uh, tongue base or molecular surgeries uh, would consider doing uh, the only thyroid causing symptoms huge uh, you manage everything you try to sort do of all the medical management this has failed uh, would you then consider doing a surgery or would you still sit back and say no surgery all any views uh, yes as you said if you tried medical management and failed then uh, excision very interestingly the lingual thyroid is very very rarely associated with malignancy so it generally is quite safe to leave alone there is only one report in the entire literature of malignancy in lingual thyroid for some reason it seems to be resistant to malignancy transformation so that's one thing we have to know if it is causing symptoms then there are basically uh, three approaches as you said the recent one it is ideally suited to a robotic uh, approach to get the back of the tongue is difficult uh, both endoscopically and open one other alternative is to do a trans cervical uh, lingual thyroid excision at the level of the hyoid you can make an incision and take 
the lingual uh, base out from. I've, I've done one of these and it has been described. So these are the options we have. The only thing which I want to make it uh, clear and bring it out on the panel is probably try to avoid doing a shaving of this mask. Because I had a very unfortunate uh, case come to me where they were kept on bleeding from the base of the tongue. It was way back, almost about five, six years ago, because the energetic uh, ENT sleep surgeon was very happy to reduce the tongue-based bulk, uh, which actually was not the tongue-based bulk, but was the lingual thyroid, and that caused bleeding, bleeding and more bleeding. And later on, it subsided after a very long effort, but the patient ended up uh, pretty bad. Uh, no wonder she was also hypothyroid. Let's proceed. Now, these are the various pictures we talked about that, you see, where is it, whether it's isolated and the medical management, particularly a general management will depend upon the scan. And it is one situation where, where I strongly recommend that we will not proceed further unless we have a I-131 scan. Otherwise, I'm not in great favor of doing I-131 scan as a, a pre-operative upfront investigation. Now, let's put this lady, 25-year-old female, just got recently married. You can obviously see for the reasons she is extremely, extremely toxic. And uh, would you operate? When would you operate? And any special precautions you will take when you operate? Can I put it to, uh, where is Rahul? Rahul is quiet for a while. Yes, sir. So essentially the first management uh, when we see a patient with Graves disease, uh, we'll be from the medical side. Uh, we'll try complete optimization uh, of a thyroid profile, get the toxicity down. However, if we are having trouble maintaining her uh, in the euthyroid status and uh, the symptoms persist, uh, along with that, uh, if the imaging studies that we do for these patients uh, show that it's uh, not just a true Graves, but having a lot of multinodularity uh, uh, along with that, and that is a time that uh, we can consider surgery for these patients uh, if the patient is not having uh, optimal uh, medical control. Now, you see here, Rahul, she is complete. She is, I mean, I tell you, put it there. She wants to get pregnant and she's a bit worried about uh, radio iodine. So, will that yes. factor into your equation? So, definitely. So, this is a discussion that needs to be taken. Uh, more or less uh, in a group setting or in an MDT setting where uh, you have the endocrinologist on board, the patient on board, I would say the gynecologist on board, uh, along with the surgeon, in terms of deciding uh, the optimal timing for surgery. Uh, per se, uh, we have had experiences in patients, uh, even say with papillary CA, where we have given high dose radio iodine, uh, post total thyroidectomies, and they are able to conceive after a year of uh, radio ID, I'm seeing the extreme cases. So, but uh, in her case, given the eye symptoms is what may be a relative contraindications uh, for giving a radio iodine because radio iodine has been known to worsen uh, eye symptoms. So I'll be a little averse in uh, deciding upon radio iodine, especially if the patient is having eye symptoms. Otherwise, once med uh, medically optimized, uh, uh, and prepared, one can plan ahead for surgery of this patient. Any special precautions or any special advice you will give tomorrow? I'm going to operate a case on, let's uh, say, she is being operated. Uh, would you say, do this, don't do this? So, typically, you would expect these thyroids to be very vascular, and uh, they will be, sometimes I feel uh, they will be far more challenging uh, compared to a regular say a total thyroidectomy that we do for, uh, you know, moderate grade, uh, not the ones that uh, Dr. Paul showed, but the regular total thyroids that we do for our papillary CS. Uh, Pre-op preparation, there has to be, uh, you'll need the endocrinologist here to optimize her medically. And also, uh, we generally uh, err on the side in the sense of giving uh, iodine to kind of uh, reduce the vascularity of the gland. We start that about a week, 10 days prior to surgery. And then we continue it uh, till the surgery. And then, I mean, we feel that uh, in our experience, uh, it has helped us in reducing the vascularity of the gland and made the surgery simpler. However, uh, during the surgery, I would be very cautious in uh, managing the blood supply. 
getting control of the blood supply much earlier because I expect higher vascularity. And I would say that uh, post-operatively also these patients would have, say, a higher incidence of uh, hypoparathyroidism, although temporary, and uh, the care. So a little more finesse in the surgery. And I would like to request this to be done uh, with experienced hands and not as a first-time surgeon. That is uh, the message that I would like to give for these patients. Professor Bharati, do you have any special uh, advice on surgery apart from whatever Rahul had just mentioned? Sir, usually we give uh, beta blockers. Yeah. So that uh, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, it uh, prevents whatever, how much ever you control the thyrotoxic level. Uh, it's better to give propranol because uh, when we are dealing with the gland, there might be sudden release. So that protects uh, our heart. So we give beta blockers. Beta blockers. Uh, anything else Pawan would like to do for her? Yes, sir. So routinely what we follow is a capsular dissection. If you talk about uh, uh, maybe malignancy or not malignant lesions. But when this situation is there, I would try to get the vascular control first. So I'll start with the superior third artery because I want to get some vascular control so that my hormone does not go in the blood so much to cause any thyroid storm down there. What, what would and you so, say about the radio ID? I mean, not radio ID, the, the Lugol's ID in Rahul mentioned. Uh, how many on the panel would you use Lugol's ID in to reduce the vascularity? I don't use it. The is nodding her head. No, 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 no. Yeah, I no, don't, sir, I don't use it. I, I don't have see the Sauro on the screen, so I don't know whether Sauro is also doing do, 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 or is he agreeing? Who is agreeing on uh, Lugol side? No, I don't have experience with Lugol side. I don't have experience. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I have some other reservations. Paul, do you have anything to say? Yeah, yeah. No, we, we used to use Lugols, but I think the data has showed that it works only in the first six months of the disease when it can actually be demonstrated on Doppler to reduce vascularity. Now, we very rarely operate on, uh, you know, at that stage in the first six months of disease. So, we now have given up actually Lugol's. And as was mentioned, the most important thing is the beta blocker to keep the pulse rate low. That's what the anesthetists want because of the intraoperative uh, arrhythmia complications should be avoided. Yeah, see, uh, I think Paul has mentioned the thing briefly. I will just take that point a little further. And the way I'll take it further is this is one case where you need to have the anesthetist, the endocrinologist, and the intensive care person right in your control, not a control, you smile at them, you sweet talk them, you buy flowers, chocolates, what do you do? But they are probably as big a player in this game as much as you are as a surgeon. They should remember. The thing about the intraoperative thyroid storm, which we all worry about, and hopefully it will never happen to us. Uh, we take all the precautions like beta blocking and all that. But what I will recommend to you very, very, very strongly is to do consider what I'm talking now is we are all, no matter how small or big, we have to be most diligent and go soft-handed with these thyroid. These thyroids are little vascular. This is hard and avoid doing all kinds of heavy retraction or pushing and pulling. And what you also do is at the slightest drop of a hint, you will probably do a muscle cut. I will not want to be egoistic here and probably release all the muscles. The third thing which I will probably do a little bit differently than Pawan is I will not so much worry about the bleeding part, but I want part the exit part. I want to get the veins first on this occasion because I don't want the thyroid hormone to be released from the gland and go into circulation. So a little bit of blood, I don't mind, but I'll get the major veins first. I'll get the inferior thyroid veins first, then the middle, and when I go to the top, I would probably be getting the vein first and then the artery so that I'm not getting a risk of uh, getting a large amount of hormone so, uh, sort of released in the circulation by the venous channels. That's very, very personal. Then other thing we should always consider is the amount of surgery. I'm sure everybody agrees on the panel that there is nothing like uh, a near total or a subtotal or a less than a total here. It has to be total because unless you have got a whole gland uh, expected, you will not have a good control in a post-operative period. The other indications which you will have to have arguments with the radiologist is about the role of radio ID in ablation of the gland. And if that has already been done, be extremely careful. But these glands are very fibrotic. 
we don't know which part is vascular and these are the sort of a nightmare situation where somebody has already used radio iodine as a preoperative or planning in their toxic state and then probably attempting to do a, a surgery the surgery for this lady is simple because she has a toxic nodule so i am not taking her into discussion for a documented toxic nodule hemithyroidectomy is adequate and good but in a non documented the grave disease which we say general thyroid toxicosis of course is a total thyroid now hashimoto thyroid another bug bear um, um, can i in interface this sorry yeah, come come please come um, there are few questions from the audience i have posted in the chat box i oh, am wait, 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 wait there are seven <laughs> chat box question which <laughs> You are an AI man. I am not an AI man. What is the time want to wait before you show? Okay, this question I got it, and this is the question I can put it to uh, any one of the panelists. Uh, is about the, what's the optimum time that you will wait uh, before you are sure that your patient is ready for surgery? What is the optimum time? Who wants to come on that? And meanwhile, I search for more questions. Can you just look at another question? Rahul, you want to come on that question? So, so optimum time to time? wait in the in the Graves disease setting, you're saying? Sorry. Uh, optimal time to wait, uh, sir. Can you just repeat the question? I didn't get the question clearly. The question I can, I can read it because it is right in front of me. It has come from Simab. Uh, when you are trying to optimize the medical treatment of Graves, what is the time limit that you wait and watch before you decide to operate? So. I would say uh, it takes at least uh, uh, three to six months for us to come to that conclusion. Typically, they are able to get control initially well. Uh, only it's uh, later on when it doesn't settle. So for me, it's when my medical endocrinologist refers the patient to me that I've tried everything, and uh, you know nothing else is working, and uh, we have to plan surgery for these patients. Uh, really. But uh, not very early is what I would say. Okay, there is a sub uh, sub question on the Simab's question, and what Simab has said that he also would like to know about the operability of a multinodular goiter, uh, and one of the nodules have become toxic. Uh, naturally, the the management here, fortunately, is not as difficult as the uh, Graves disease one. These nodules can come very handy very quickly. They don't even need a radio iodine ablation and. Uh, that of course the the proposals are separate are really easy uh, now Dr. Kape, physical yeah can i just come in on that the graves of course of course, actually, of course. Uh, there's a there's a quick way to look at it you know if, when the graves comes initially there are reasons to operate up front that is you have a nodule that may be associated with malignancy you know slight increase in papillary cancers in thyroid in graves so if you have a hypothyroid nodule that's suspicious on fna associate this called a marine lenart syndrome then you operate up absolutely front. now the other reason as you said somebody wanting early pregnancy want to go doesn't want to wait then that may be an option for early surgery or patient's choice they don't want some people don't like radioactivity so they uh, prefer surgery now the general principle is you can do medical management for about 18 months uh, because if it is mild and going to remit to the low antibody level it will do so within 18 months that's what the data has shown and if it doesn't do so by 18 months then you must think of a definitive therapy which is either surgery or radioiodine so that is the uh, way you approach uh, graves disease there is another very interesting question which has come on the chat box and uh, i have not done it uh, so i will raise my arms and say i'm sorry i have not done it but uh, has anybody any experience of implanting thyroid like what we implant parathyroids anybody has any experience on this i, I have not even sort of uh, heard anybody doing it any experience on this well this is a historical question actually it was done in early days in coker's time as well and it was shown that implanted thyroid does not function but very interestingly uh, you know it has come up again now uh, one of my colleagues in uh, uk is uh, taking this on as a project and has asked me also to look at it because in the modern day people are very sensitive to replacement 
of thyroxin. You know, yeah, all of you who have done total thyroids, if you're following up these patients, some will be very fussy about the dose. And if they, if it is slightly TSH off, they feel, uh, you know, diffident, they, they may not, they don't feel proper of the gun. It depends on the work they're doing. So there is a new uh, approach now to see whether you can harvest normal thyroid, uh, proven uh, genetically that it's not of malignant origin, put it in a mesenchymal scaffolding and see whether you can re-implant this tissue and it will function so that normal uh, physiological uh, function may be better in these cases who are not doing well with uh, thyroxine replacement. This is a topic that's coming. Yeah, okay, I will take that uh, further. Uh, there had been a work done where we say if it's only submental triangle or so, so uh, thyroid which is in the neck, not on the tongue, uh, but the only thyroid, and people are trying to do uh, a complete excision and take the vasculature, particularly the arteries, because they say and they believe that the vessels which are associated with this thyroid are almost similar to the superior thyroid artery. So if you can get a nice arterial supply, which you can identify when you're dissecting and connect it to one of the arteries in the neck. And I had read only about this kind of a surgery being performed, but the, the results were not very good. Uh, the reason why they were not very good was because the probably in those days when these surgeries were performed, the, the technique of vascular anastomosis probably was not as developed as it is now, but it is something which the questioner has put into my mind. And I will probably think about it because we don't get these cases that often. The only functioning sublingual thyroid, uh, submental triangle thyroid is not that often uh, an occurrence, but should I get it sometimes? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, the next question which has appeared on the chat box was about the, the Lugol's iodine, the dose and the timing and the duration. Rahul, can you take that question because you did mention Lugol's iodine. So we typically do it uh, uh, say a week 10 days prior we give it for minimum for a week and uh, we give it in uh, uh, the two drops of the glucose iodine diluted in the glass of water to these patients once a day for seven days so uh, that's how we give it we have a special pharmacy uh, which uh, uh, kind of like manufactures it it's called uh, so it's not something which is commercially available very easily uh, but it needs to be procured from a special pharmacy uh, close to KIM hospital. So uh, we just inform the patient to collect it. And uh, since it's a planned surgery, we are able to do that. Okay, I hope you got your answer, sir. Uh, I didn't get the name, uh, but uh, I think Rahul has adequately explained the dose and the timing and the duration. Now, the lady here on the left, uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis. Very hard, obviously seen cosmetically also. Uh, anybody will be... Uh, what's your plan? I mean, that's the, the same lady has got the picture. Any any um, advices on her? How would you handle her? I'm going to show one more picture of Hashimoto. Just keep this old lady. Now, I think Paul will be itching to answer this question. Can I give it to Paul? Paul is gone. Uh, no, I'm here. Yeah. No, Hashimoto, in gen the overall picture is if we have a diagnosis, small goiter with antibody positive, 90% do not require surgery. Over time, they tend to uh, shrink and calcify and regress. So if the patient, there the are two reasons. One, um, the patient has an associated nodule, which you are suspecting may be malignant. And now, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of these papillaries that come in a background of uh, Hashimoto and hyperplasia. So the diagnosis itself is not an exclusion of malignancy. You have to identify the nodules and assess them independently. Or rarely, sometimes the patient have mixed antibody. You may have a Hashi with Graves toxicity. That's also an indication to operate. Or you may have a Hashi with a background nodular hyperplasia that has its own either secondary toxicity or uh, a, a, a suspicious nodule. And rarely, we, it, although it's classically described as painless, some may be uh, firm and painful and causing local compressive symptoms. Those would be the ones to take out. And uh, as we all know, these are difficult uh, operatively. They just need to be handled. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, just uh, a quick uh, con uh, concluding on this particular lady, that she is an age group where you are worried about uh, a, a long-standing Hashimoto thyroiditis turning into a malignancy particularly the papillary form of the well-differentiated thyroid cancer. So very vigilant on her. 
because she is a case where we could be having a combination of pitch adhesion with spinal small focus, which will eventually probably cause trouble. So I'll be very watchful on this lady and may consider surgery a little earlier. But if I have to take the next lady, this one, here probably I will not be too keen on surgery because there are no features indicating of interfering with her in surgical way. So these are the two kind of different picture where one would say yes, one would say no. Uh, just a little question on the other kinds of thyroiditis that we handle. Uh, but before I move on to that, I must put a little question. This is a fighting question between all the uh, endocrine uh, doctors, which are clever doctors, uh, and the not so clever doctors that are us, which are the surgeon. I mean, incidentally, you know, in my days, I don't know how it compared with your days, uh, Rahul, but all the intelligent guys and those so-called who got the number one, two, three, and four became physicians. And those were from the bottom 10, 9, and 7 became the surgeon. Is it still the truth? Or I guess it's still the same, sir. I guess it's still the same. So when the meeting comes, now it's the, the intellect will say the carpenters. So let's put it like this. We have a Hashimoto and the, the, the usual battlefield is how would you handle, when would you will give a suppressive dose of thyroxine? Will you use steroids? Two questions. Do you believe in suppressing her thyroid? by exogenous thyroxine, and do you believe on giving them uh, steroids? Anybody can take the question. Madam, what do you do? Painful, toxic, young lady. Yeah. In subacute uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis, uh, I give steroids, short course. And then if the TSH is normal, I don't think I give any suppressive therapy, sir. What it says is slightly higher. I make it a little complicated. Now, because yeah. most of them will come to you in a hypertoxic or toxic state in the beginning part of their thyroid. Then also, then also we don't give, sir. Then also you don't give. You will not consider uh, suppressing the No, we, we, we follow them up because in the initial phase, because of the hyperfunctioning. Yeah. I mean, you uh, in the initial phase and talking it is hyper functioning so we have more hormones and when the yeah. burnt out stage then we have the uh, less uh, hormones so if the burnt out stage is there then we give okay what's the what's the and advice in the burnt come... out stage in the acute phase there is no role yeah then practical question practical answer when you come to my age and you don't want to get in the debates on this just send this patient to a very bright young endocrinologist and let him handle it and be sort of sit back and enjoy and tell him when you want me to operate, I'll come in. No, 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 just joking. Don't do it. Don't shy away. Face the problem. There are certain other things I would like to know very quickly. Uh, there are patients who often come to you with extreme dysphagia, can't swallow, can't drink. And these are the extreme situation. But then there are also earlier patients, many patients, about, I would say 30% of so-called globus hystericus that comes to our clinic with symptom of lump in the throat, if you palpate their neck carefully and run your finger on the thyroid and ask them to swallow, majority of them will say, ah, it hurts here. Ah, it's a catch here. And they are very early lymphocytic thyroiditis. So I put this across that we talked about the extreme weather, the pain, fever, toxic. On the other side, they only come to you like a globus. I will still investigate them and treat them like a acute or sort of an inactive form of thyroiditis. The second lot of inflammatory conditions of thyroid are subacute, bacterial, and probably viral sometimes. And you will treat them on their own merit. The only thing which worries me, which I have not seen many, but does occur and keep it in the mind, is this boy. This is tubercular thyroiditis. And he went from pillar to post to pillar to post and nobody could get diagnosis. Ultimately, I was a clever man because I saw this and all I did was did a biopsy there and it came with a big granuloma and that was TB. So don't forget that TB in our country can hit anything. And don't think that the thyroid is an exception. Maybe we're under-diagnosing it, but if it's a known case, this boy even looked at the faces of that boy, they even thought him as a nephrotic. Anyway, so that was about, um, and as I said, with my age, you become the best person to refer. Such cases will be, of course, an endocrinologist, which is a little cocky guy. Now, here it is simple. 
but always not so simple. This is a multinodal recorder. Somebody asked me a while ago, I think Simab, that one of these nodules are actually active and she undergoes a uh, surgery which is total thyroidectomy. On the other side, this is young lady. Now, often these ladies are put for radioiodine ablation of a toxic nodule. How many of you will agree that she should go for radio ablation of a toxic nodule? Can I start with probably uh, Pawan has not spoken for a while and so has Saurabh. So any one of the two, Saurabh or Pawan? Yes. A lady with a toxic nodule, would you like to treat her with radioiodine? Um, I would like to operate, sir, uh, and first go. Because even with radioiodine, I've seen they are coming back. This nodule persists there, and she has got, most of the time, they have got this anxiety or harboring a cancer inside. So that is one thing which makes an indication there. And these toxic nodules, I have seen that even if you give radioiodine, they are coming back with a similar nodule, with a similar problems patient have. So certainly I would, I would operate if it is a youth or a disease. Any, any other reason to operate? And I'm asking this question to Saurabh because he's a sort of a more aggressive surgeon amongst us because the more aggressive become the oncosurgeons. Na? You, Saurabh, any other reason to operate? Sir, uh, he said they come back, but there is one more reason to operate. Sir, uh, means uh, does she possess a reproductive age? That is one uh, thing, the second lady. And, um, but uh, in today's, I am telling you, even uh, though very rarely we, we get benign cases, I'm uh, being in an onco center, very rarely we get any benign cases, but still once or twice when we have, and I can say that even our endocrinologists, when they prefer them to be operated, they always say surgery is better uh, compared to, so, uh, but I don't know, uh, I means uh, radioiodine, I don't have much experience in this situation. Majority of the time we operate. You see, there is another reason to operate on these patients, particularly the one lady here, is that a lot of these uh, Hashimoto or thyroiditis or so-called uh, unilateral thyrotoxicosis like situation will have a nodule which will apparently be active or a toxic, but may be reported as an early papillary focus. So I would like that thing also on my mind that maybe I would request my pathologist, please look at the specimen carefully that this might be a, a, a sort of a toxic or a Hashimoto or Graves with a nodule, which might be a malignancy. Now, this is a common gardener variety at Chikaldara. Anybody who has come to Chikaldara, they know that these are kind of a cases we are faced with in our Chikaldara workshop. And always this question comes to me, the scope for surgery, indications for surgery, and how much to operate. Any doubts about any of these things? Can you just forget this picture? These are clear cut pictures. Take a multinodular goiter, which is not as big as this, but they're still big, cosmetically worrisome. Uh, anybody will take a peek and say, in today's day and age, anybody would think about doing subtotal or near total. Absolutely not. It will be total thyroid. Total thyroid. Pavan, you are raising your finger. Anything? Uh, sir, this is a big one. Even if it is a very small and it has got multinodularity, the chances of harboring malignancy multinodularity is less than 1%. Maybe to the tune of 1%. So if it is very small and it is not causing any dysphagia or dyspnea or change of voice, no recurrent involvement. And if patients does has not got any cosmetic or anxiety concerns, then we can follow these cases. But if it is a large one, an apparent one, and patient has got anxiety, it is causing cosmetically disappealing appearance, then certainly they should be out. There should be no surgery like subtotal or neototal now. Either it should be a total therapy to these cases if multinodal got involving both groups. Now you have been to Chikaldara quite a few times. Yes, sir. Um, uh, tell me your views. I am saying ki, the lady works in jungle. She doesn't come to the town. She cannot take eltroxine, thyroxine. Uh, where is she going to get the money from, etc., etc. Uh, why don't you save some thyroid, sir? Answer that. So, 
I am really because I think that uh, the thyroid that we're going to save uh, may not reliably help us also, sir. So it is not going to serve the purpose and it is just going to make a job more difficult. I think, I mean, it's tragic that the access to medications there is uh, still a concern, but uh, I mean, we cannot compromise on surgery. I typically keep, I mean, Chikaldala cases that way, decision making wise are pretty straightforward, I would say. I would not advocate leaving thyroid tissue behind even in these patients. Uh, uh, generally, I keep a threshold of about four centimeters or more. So I feel if the nodule has grown till four centimeters, the nodule knows how to grow further. So typically malignancy or no malignancy, then surgery should be the way forward with the patient on board. Some patients, uh, if they are not keen to wait, uh, if they are keen to wait, then I'm happy to follow them up. But uh, typically, I keep a threshold of about four centimeters, uh, even in benign cases, uh, to go ahead with surgery. Yeah, okay. Versus, okay. Yeah. I, I, I tell you my answers to such questions where they come to me fairly often at Chikaldara. Number one is that there is no possibility of a redo surgery. End of the story. Number one. Yes. Number two is that even if I leave some amount of thyroid tissue behind, there is no guarantee that that thyroid tissue is going to work. Exactly. I mean, that's not going to be functional. So she will still require an eltroxin or a thyroxin support. The only logic that may be behind doing a near total or a subtotal on this lady, huh? parathyroid. Parathyroid. absolutely, the is the safety for the parathyroid that if you are an occasional thyroid surgeon and do not feel confident in identifying or saving the parathyroid, maybe there is a wisdom in leaving the lower pole on both sides and thereby, but it's a hazardous thing to do. It is not technically possible. It is bloody affair. And if you try to cut through the thyroid, even at the lower pole, it bleeds like a stinker. So probably you pray to your gods and say that, please save me from uh, parathyroids and probably do your job as best as you can. But I think the scope and how much is a total thyroidectomy. The question has just come up here on the chat box saying about the NIFTP, but I'm going to touch that question, sir, in a little while when you come to the, the, the malignancy parts. And I'll save that question because I know it's a burning topic uh, and we are facing it. And I have faced it much worse than anybody else has. So I'll come to that in a little while. And the, 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 the just wait a minute. Compressive. And this is the typical uh, retrosternal variety that we see. Now, how many of you will jump into calling a, a thoracic man, and how many of you will say, oh, well, I will handle it. And if so, what gives you that arrogant confidence that I will handle it? I will handle it, I will handle it trans-cervical. I think Bharati is smiling. Go on, Bharati. You know the answer. Tell the guys. <laughs> no, Tell the guys. When will you so, do it yourself? If it is just multinodular goiter, always it gets its blood supply originally. The vessels are placed at their places. So you can just go ahead, whatever, you can just deliver the, uh, when you put uh, the neck into extension, a part of the thyroid, which has extended retrosternally will come up. And then the remaining, uh, we can just, with the finger dissection, we can deliver because the blood supply is where originally it is. Whereas if at all you are dealing with malignancy, then it requires blood supply, it acquires its blood supply in this new place. Then we need to do the sternotomy. If at all you are, well versed with that, you can go ahead, sir. Otherwise, you need to call the, you can do with the thoracic surgeons. Sir, how often have you actually called a thoracic man to do it? No, sir, I have done myself. Sir, actually, you do your own. Sir, yeah. actually uh, means again, we have some privilege that actually in these cases, uh, sometimes mean malignancy and more often in malignancy, what we get large, Notes, notes in the external yes. things. So even in this situation, majority of the time we can go to the arch of the arch and we can take it from neck. But always, uh, I I always uh, mean take our uh, means tell our thoracic surgeon to be standby. And as it is in the same hospital, we always take the privilege that boss I have a case and if required I will call you. Call but you. very, very, very open. But just last week, we did a case of um, uh, Pepsia. There was a very low down neck below the arch of aorta, and they did a VATS to remove it. Otherwise, uh, 
most of the time it take out we can take out it from the knee any any radiological uh, clues that you will have that uh, maybe this will come out trans cervical so one pawan pawan so uh, up to the level of t4 sir angle of louis if you see and if it is a continuation of the thyroid uh, mass you can take it out through the no neck sir with your finger dissection but okay. if it is going beyond that down there you certainly need a thoracic surgeon in standby um, and if there are separate nodules or nodes there in the thorax then certainly thoracotomy is an option we should think of for clearance of the disease down there. okay we are about uh, halfway three fourth way so i will not take more uh, time on question but i'll just try to sum up in the retrosternal part i will say that first of all take the transverse diameter of the tumor the largest diameter of the tumor or the retrosternal part of the goiter with the exit point of the neck and if that transverse diameter is greater than the neck exit diameter then be careful that it may not all deliver this is number 1 number 2 is is it a vascular or a visceral retrosternal goiter now the way i differentiate is the vascular retrosternal goiter is between the arch of the aorta on both sides so common carotid both side coming in and therefore it will be always above the arch so it will be between the two carotids and the arch so this is a visceral type or sorry vascular type and therefore this will come up in the neck but if it is a visceral type that means it is dissecting between the esophagus and the trachea then that's not always easy to get it without sternotomy because it is going in a different plane the third is with dr bharti said very correctly is malignant versus benign and she also explained the cause for it that the benign thyroid will pull its blood supply with it down in the neck so once you have got control on that in the neck it is the finger dissection and i do another maneuver which is called as a head low and feet up kind of a thing so that the gravity also assists you in pulling it gently down and the 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 biggest of the things will isolatedly come out the third criteria which i use which i not put on my slide is with this isolated retrosternal or is it a continuous with the main thyroid because quite often if you do an mri you find that there is a flimsy tract but most of the thyroid in the neck is normal or just hypertrophic but the main bulk of retrosternal goiter is behind the sternum be careful with these guys because they may require a mini sternotomy as they call these days and and may be very difficult to handle uh, but if it is a continuous one that means the retrosternal part is continuous with the main part they are easy feasy but if we have separate two things which we have de novo and the sac is uh, remnant of thyroid cells is something which people blame that these are the goiter stack is remnant which is coming in the retrosternal now the sternal split if you talk to the thoracic surgeon they are very nowadays egoistic they call a mini split sternotomy just claviculotomy that different word they use but don't going into it i think what saurabh said is the right thing keep them informed keep them under the loop and if possible if you do work in two different places it is probably better to go in their unit or their ot and operate rather than you operating in the unit and calling them in your ot because they may not be comfortable these are practical things and be humble you always say mai tere ko bataya tha rather than pehle kyun nahi bataya that's a typical argument now the last on this benign sort of stories is incidental loma and this is going to happen more frequently in future then it what happened to me in my career maybe rahul and pawan and saurabh you will get them by dozens hopefully we will not get them so frequently but yes. they are coming any policy on managing incident loma let's go from bharati and at the end saurabh and then anybody can chip in so what's your policy uh, professor bharati so when is, he he has no symptom like, in the thyroid it is yeah. your colleague who had done for neck spine or something and they come up with a nodule in the neck now ah uh, in the thyroid now yes sir then we see the features of this thyroid nodule uh whether it is less than 1 cm or more than all this uh, uh risk stratification features of the thyroid nodule ultrasonographic features we see and then we take the history also 
the patient history, like any family history of uh, uh, thyroid malignancy is there or any past exposure to radiation. And then with these two things, then the plan changes. If at all nothing is there, if it is less than one centimeter and nothing, then there's no need to worry. Whereas if at all, there is something positive in the history or in the ultrasonic feature, then we need to go ahead and do the ultrasonogram uh, uh, guided FNAC. So. Okay. And then depending uh, on the that. Then you, then you go to whatever is required. Yeah. Yeah. Rahul, any, anything or Pawan, anything? And Saurabh, go on. So all incidentaloma, sir, uh, needs to be treated like you would treat any other thyroid nodularity disease. I mean, just because they have been incidentally detected, uh, we should not ignore them. We should follow the same routine that we approach any thyroid nodular disease. Get an ultrasound done to know the characteristics of the disease. Get a thyroid function test done. And if you find any nodules which merit an FNAC, do that. Uh, I'm just a little more cautious about uh, nodules which we get on PET scans. So FDG avid uh, nodules tend to have a, a higher risk of about 30% risk of malignancy. So uh, I will take that data into play when deciding upon uh, further management. But just because they have been incidentally detected, we should not treat them differently. We should do our workup like we would do for any thyroid nodular disease and take the history and uh, those points into consideration while managing uh, these patients. Absolutely comprehensive. Uh, just one more word now, because of these uh, newer things happening, uh, post-op, a lot of people are getting, even pre-op, uh, not necessary, but they get their MRIs done. And sort of what is your experience of somebody reporting a thyroid nodule where you had a buccal cancer or where you have got some other disease and the neck uh, is been mri and in that MRI there is nodule. How will you handle that nodule now? It's an ipsilateral nodule on the thyroid for a buccal cancer or any other cancer. It depends because uh, what you say, if we, if I am going for a buccal cancer and uh, I am uh, uh, on my imaging, we got a uh, nodule, nodule. But as Rahul said, that any incidentoloma, whatever the reason, whenever it is detected, we have to we have to see what is it. So say after the FNAC, it comes as uh, it comes as a papillary thyroid carcinoma. It may be an incidentaloma less than one centimeter, it may be two centimeter. So if we are planning or working up for a buccal cancer, definitely we are going to neck and I will definitely address this thyroid. However, sometimes it happens that somebody is suffering from a GI cancer or a uh, gynecological cancer. On, in, on PET CT evaluation, they found a nodule in the thyroid and they already means most of the time they do the FNAC or even if they send us to uh, them to us, any PET CT, what Rahul said, any focal uptake in PET, PET CT. If there is a diffuse uptake, it is generally for thyroiditis. But if it is focal uptake, 33% chance, almost one third are malignant. So you will need a little. But even if in this case, if there is a PAP CA thyroid, if it is small, we always discuss with other, means our colleagues who are dealing with say, gynecological cancer or GI cancer, we assess what is the chance of survival or what is the prognosis of the disease. Because if we are dealing with a very advanced say, liver cancer or a, we are doing a whipples for a pancreatic cancer, we don't see any reason to address a small incidentaloma in the neck because the outcome of these diseases are bad. But at the same time, if we are dealing with a buccal cancer, whatever it is advanced stage, if we are dealing it, if we are planning to open the neck, I will definitely address the thyroid. That is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Rahul and Saurabh has comprehensively summed it up that the management uh, and the point which is very definitely done is a PET scan coming after some other cancer. Give priority to the other cancer and the prognosis of the other cancer and put the PET reports on the thyroid on the side and evaluate them on the basis of the prognosis that may be with the other cancer. And if the other cancer has a poor prognosis, like exactly what Saro said, he is not going to get killed by the thyroid cancer. Probably his other cancer will step over in the race. So be judicious. Excellent. Very nice.
Now treat them on their own merit. Now this looks like a mundane cancer. She's a female, but this is not the same. Now here we are coming and I got last 15 minutes, which I deliberately spared because thyroid cancers are rare. They don't happen often and until you are a dedicated thyroid surgeon or an oncosurgeon um, and you're not uh, sort of a general ENT handling thyroid, uh, thyroid cancers are not that uh, sort of a commonly happening things. Uh, about the total body cancer, they only about 1%, but about the total nodules, they are a larger percentage, which will come up in a minute. So let's talk about these things. And uh, no, I'll not put this slide up. I'll put this slide a little later. I hastily put that up. Uh, I want guys to say that what are the features in the symptom that you're looking for in this particular man, which will tell you, ah, it's a red flag. This is Garbhar. Anybody can go first, symptoms wise. This guy comes with a thyroid nodule. Obviously, it's a thyroid. You want to know more. What more you want to know? One is, sir, uh, the, the progression rate. If he is saying that he has noticed this nodule, it was uh, one centimeter, two, three months back, that it is rapidly increasing in size. This is one. If there is some hoarseness of voice, if uh, the patient is, uh, if on palpation there is, or if we can see obvious swelling in the other side of the neck, which may be a uh, means a metastatic node signifies. So these are the features where uh, if there if there is there, we will always be very, a bit cautious. If anything, uh, if they are saying that a small nodule, but he is facing uh, some amount of uh, say dysphagia or something, most of the time these are very much uh, robust things. In the thyroid nodule, especially in female, they will say that uh, uh, what you discussed, that we should rule out lymphocytic thyroiditis. But even in small nodule, a lot of time they, they complain it. Most of the time it's globus. But anything like uh, solitary nodule, which is rapidly increasing, though, though a thyroid cancer generally doesn't increase rapidly, but still. And second, third is... Um, uh, Hoarseness of voice, these are the, or if there is lateral swelling, neck swelling, it signifies okay. this is a lymph node metastasis. These are okay. really okay. warning signs. Well, we are trespassing into the areas where you work so often, so I'll keep you till the end. Anything other than what Saurabh said, anybody wants to join in there? So so a, a hard nodule, or a six nodule, it is not moving with the fingers, but, and it is hard on consistency. I think they are the additional features. That makes it run. Dr. Bharti, anything else you want to add or shall I sum up? Uh, sir, uh, any uh, separate nodule like swelling has come up in the neck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So these are the worrisome that the pain, no thyroid swelling, which is benign, will be painful. The only painful swellings are either they are thyroiditis one or they are malignant ones. They're never tender. So that's something which happens. You touch them and they say pain, you are worried. Hoarseness, obviously, recurrent nerve. But the other thing which is hoarseness is some edema because of the pure largeness of the swelling. Dysphagia, not happens with the benign swelling. Usually dysphagia means malignancy unless it is a nodule in the TO group, which is posterior place, which we can give a selective dysphagia. But normal, that's a red flag. Size and the other nodules, which all the panelists have so correctly explained. Now, this is another one. A nodule which is in a man, a lateral nodule in a young female, and of course, a thyrotoxic lady which has multinodular goiter but suddenly has started growing, and they all require clinical investigation. And these are the various risk certification. I'm not going to go into each one of them, but I'm going to just ask any comments that do they prefer one to the other, or they have their own, or would say, oh, any, any comment on this? I mean, there are about 18 types of these available. I just put up about six or seven. Saurabh, so, start. Sir, uh, there are a lot of, and practically speaking, nowadays, most of us are following ATU, yeah. categorization. Low, intermediate, high. So basically, these all risk statistics are post-surgical, after surgery. And basically, these are for prognosis or radioactive treatment. These are not MS, G, uh, 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 GMES, anything, AJS, anything. 
these are basically for, for post surgical uh, prognostication and uh, so nowadays we are basically using none of them we are using ata risk stratification okay uh, paul do you have anything at velor i think he's gone anyway huh? no he is there he is there yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he missed the question sorry about the risk stratification right? yeah yeah any special policy yeah no no what we started now using is also the dynamic risk stratification Exactly. It is uh, because you know when the patient comes initially, it's very difficult to predict the long-term outcome based on the clinical and pathological characteristics. So it's the response to treatment over the first two years that is a stronger determinant of long-term outcome. So what we do is at the second year, uh, at the end of two years after you know the iodine scans ablation are over and you have TG uh, follow-up period then you get a very good idea how this is going to behave long term in the well differentiated and the medullary thesis used uh, it's called dynamic risk stratification exactly. absolutely you touched the point which I, where i wanted to go and sort up the first point you see we got so many of them plethora of them but the problem is that some of them do consider the pathology which we do not know beforehand they can the histology which you don't know beforehand they do not know the radioiodine avidity which you do not know before and number one. And the second thing is they change their place. What was high risk to begin with can become low risk or what was low risk to begin with can become a high risk. And the single point of feature I'm telling you on the top there, look at the slide which I put in there is a young lady with a not so big a nodule, but look at it, it's all adverse feature. If you look at that swelling, this looks like a high grade. It has come out, it has broken the thyroid, it is on the periphery of the tumor, it is in the upper half, so everything is wrong for it. But once you remove it and it's gone, she becomes low risk. So therefore, please bear it in mind that don't fall verbatim to the various risk stratification methods which have been given in the book. Apply your own knowledge, apply your own sort of a conscious and have your own philosophy board on board before you start handling the CA thyroid. Now, this is what we all have known. This is what we all have been talking about high risk tumors, low risk tumor, low risk patient, high risk patient. We know all this. And then the jigsaw, which goes which way, which is that low risk. I mean, I'm not, because I've got only five more minutes, seven more minutes left. So I just put it there for everybody to know that if there is one feature which is low risk and the other feature is high risk, you take it as a high risk. If the both features are low risk, obviously it is a low risk. So depending upon, but all these old wives sort of stories don't hold true in modern context. And what really you should know is the dynamic certification that you keep on changing. You keep on adding to your knowledge, the pathologists, the nowadays we are even molecular markers and all these things take into account and then decide upon your own policy. If it is a high risk, there is no doubt. There is low risk, there is no doubt. But it is the intermediate group which kicks up the dust in all the oncology meetings. And people will leave, fight over the thing, and probably only a glass of beer at the end of the day will cool their argument between them. Because people feel very strongly about one way or the other. Now, optimal surgery can just, I mean, I got about four of them, so let's run fast. 25 year female, 1.5 nodule, deliberately put it at there, not two, not one. Not four, just 1.5. Thyroid six, Bethesda five. What's the surgery in your books? Let's start off with uh, Saurav. Again, this is some great uh, yeah, scope of debate. You know, starting I, from I, this is put there very deliberately because from you, Billy Moria, Billy Moria in 2000, Bharti and Rahul. Yeah, go on. Billy Moria study in 2007. They have shown that even if any nodule more than one centimeter it requires total thyroidectomy. Even in one to two centimeter, they say it's better. But in 2014, if you say Adam's paper, they have shown that one to four centimeter, even between two to four centimeter, both have equal outcome. Even in Billy Moria study, if you see that the overall survival was a little bit, it's 98 point, I think seven or one percent difference. But it was statistically significant because the volume was very high. Now, having said that, my practice, what I did in my practice, any nodule, more than one centimeter, I give both options to the patients. I always discuss and I always document in my prescription that both 
pros and cons of hemi and total thyroidectomy, provided that there is no nodal metastasis, there is no distant metastasis, and there is no high risk uh, features like all cell, hubnail cell, columnar cell type of features. So if these are there, we, we have to go for a total. But if it is a classical pap CA, Stop, stop, sorry. You will not about know about tall cells and other cells before uh, your surgery. You'll only get to know them afterwards. So, sir, sometimes, sir, sometimes in pathological uh, means uh, yeah, they said that, that they can see it means uh, some uh, okay. cells are yeah. If this okay. is there, then only. I am saying, but it's Branded. very rare. I am yeah, telling yeah, it's yeah. very rare. Yeah. So, if there is nothing, I give both the option. I give both the option to the patient. But if uh, but most of the time, patient says, you decide. So in her case, if, if she says me that you decide if the lesion is posteriorly placed close to the now, I would probably, uh, even in that case, means I will probably in her case, I will go for a uh, hemithyroidectomy. Okay. Um, Professor Bharati, you Bhagwan hai, aapi this is a very common knowledge. We are common and we like to play gods. I mean, let's be honest. We like that title. We all want to play gods. In her case, would you like to play God and say Hemi? Sir, actually, uh, what, two things. One is she's less than uh, 55 years and she's a female. That thing is there. But our ultrasonogram is still at six and Betsera is five. So I think after, as Dr. Saurav said, We'll counsel the patient. We'll talk to her. And my opinion, I'll go for total thyroid. In this for uh, Paul, what's the position in Vellore? Will you play God and give a decision or would you let the patient decide? Yeah, no, this is an um, uh, sort of individualizable decision. So I think there's some young people, as I said, uh, you know, young, uh, the outcome is good, whatever you do. So... If she, if she is concerned about you know the complications about taking drug uh, medication regularly i think this is something that young people worry about uh, then i think we can offer her and she's willing to do the follow-up uh, we can offer her a hemithyroidectomy so this requires a detailed discussion of the pros and cons and i have had people opt for hemithyroidectomy for this very reason but yeah, so you have to select carefully if it is somebody who's coming from a remote area and who's not going to do follow-up um, then it may be difficult to stop with the hemi. So, and that that is where I go. Yeah, Rahul, you had been in America during your early days of training, and you had this sort of a informed consent and decision making uh, with that set of people over there. And now you are back in India for several years, and you have got this set of patients with uh, so-called informed involvement of them into decision making. Where would you put it? I mean, does it lie the onus on us to give them some kind of a guidance or does it lie upon entirely uh, the patient? So, sir, in my experience, frankly, I mean, the concerns remain the same, whether in the US or here. Patients are very well informed nowadays. Internet is there for everybody to read up and talk about it. And it comes down to individualized patient. If the patient is comfortable with leaving, so I'll be very comfortable doing a hemi only if uh, the other side is absolutely clean on ultrasound and, uh, you know, really no nodes and it's just that uh, small nodules and, you know, this is 1.5 centimeters more of like, you know, an incidentally kind of detected kind of, a, we rarely come across with such kind of a clinical scenario where, you know, you are uh, dealing with such a low grade kind of a disease. However, the scenario say I have done a lobectomy for a patient and then I find a foci of cancer in it, then I would not go ahead. So say if I've done a hemithyroidectomy for a five centimeter nodule, which turns out to be benign, but there is an additional foci of like a four, uh, four millimeter or an eight millimeter foci of papillary CA, then I'm very comfortable watching. However, upfront, uh, it depends upon a lot about patients' uh, concerns and cares. A lot of patients, uh, especially in professional voice users, I will be careful in advising total in such a well localized disease, especially when we don't have uh, a diagnosis of malignancy in hand. However, I will also counsel them that I'll be very liberal in advising completion at a later stage if we find any of the high risk features in uh, the final histopathology. Uh, 
uh, if you are doing a hemi in these patients. And sir, and sir always, is, if I am planning for hemi, yes, always I take a consent that on table, if I find any adverse feature, because even if I am going for hemi, every time I just look, I just inspect the central compartment. Because uh, even in one of my friends, uh, he's a doctor, his wife, I plan for a hemi, and I say, I saw a uh, one centimeter node in the central compartment, I said for frozen, it came out as a positive. So I went for a total thyroid. So I always take a consent for him total thyroidectomy on table. Yeah, that's the speed. That's the thing we were talking about the dynamic uh, sort of uh, upgrading all the time and dynamic risk therapy. The trouble is, you see, that we don't have our own statistics. I mean, this is my lamenting ever since the ISTS has formed. That there are Japanese watching four centimeter with the neck. There are Americans jumping up and down from one to four and come down again to 1.5 to two. And the beta, which is the British Academy, we are friends of ours, they are somewhere around two and four. So I think time has come that people like uh, places with high volume, like maybe you, uh, Saurabh, then uh, Paul and Deepak, and people are doing high volume work on malignancy should come up with some kind of a guideline. More, but that's not this forum I want to talk. I'll, I'll talk about that on an ISTS forum. Now, the arguments in favor of lobectomies, I put it up there. Then arguments in against lobectomy, we have already discussed. And the recommendation for lobectomy as we stand today in the international book is anything which is less than a centimeter without extrathyroid spread and no distance or nodal metastasis. All over the world, people agree that this is for a lobectomy. Now, another mundane, 55 year old female, I put that age because that's a debatable age, growing slowly, painless, four centimeter, Moose depletion dysphagia, vocal cord mobile, no neck nose, diagnosis is WDTC. What will you do? Anybody can take that. Definitely. In, uh, because there is case. the only, only thing which I not mentioned there is probably the nodal status, but it is a nodal status. Sorry, I mentioned that. No neck nose. Yeah. In, in, this, in this scenario, uh, probably, since I will definitely, it's a 55 years, so higher side. Uh, four centimeter again, like 1.5 is I can say it's very close to one. Similarly, four and 4.5, this is not a much difference. Definitely, for this case, I will go for a total. Thyroid. Yeah, okay. I'll run through because we're already eight uh, five minutes late. These are the kind of uh, arguments in favor of doing total. These are the recommendations where would you go for total? These are in the books. Uh, but my own personal last comment on this is it all depends upon how good you can dissect or how confident you are to save the parathyroids. If you are good to save the recurrent laryngeal nerve and good to save the parathyroids, probably you can err on the side of radicality. But if you are not good to save and not confident enough for these structures, then please be more conservative because your surgery can damage more than your surgery can help. It's a mundane, it's a non uh, sort of a fatal disease and your surgery can be more harmful than the disease itself. So watch out that. And if you can get these kind of pictures where you have seen nice functioning parathyroids, the blood supply saved, the, the recurrent uh, nerve saved, you can see the inferior thyroid artery with all this glorious branching. If you are able to do a dissection where you are able to say confidently that, yes, I have saved the artery which is going to the parathyroids nicely and only picked up. See the picture on the left, you see the one artery which is leaving and going on the top toward the upper parathyroid, then you can see the inferior thyroid artery branching downwards, slanting down and going to the inferior parathyroid, and only one little twig going to the into the thyroid. You are able to see such things in the surgery, then probably you are justified in doing radical surgery. If not, probably you are more justified in being conservative. So the great divide is the surgeon's aptitude, attitude, and skill. I will not touch MTC, it is a, it's a long thing. I'll come straight back onto the neck nodes. And uh, although the, the staging, etc. doesn't matter and the surgical plan remains, people say the nodal status doesn't affect the adversely, like the squamous cell carcinoma, the treatment does affect. So I got five more minutes and I will conclude by saying that management is, uh, Saurav had touched the central compartment that he will always look at the central compartment but the dissection should be something like this for any uh, thing. And for here, let me add to the ENT surgeon, because as ENT surgeon, I'm caught out in many discussion 
that the lateral compartment does not include 5A and B. The lateral compartment, we talk about the thyroid surgery, is only 2, 3, and 4, and the central compartment is 6 and 7 if required. So this is a little nomenclature cliche, but the general ENT can get caught out here. So I'm running through here far because we are overboard. These are the recommendations. Anybody can look at them. Uh, extra travel spread. I think Paul has done extremely, extremely. I have no words to appreciate his uh, uh, diligent talk. So I will not spend talk on here. Just, no. just with your permission, may I ask Dr. Paul one question just uh, regarding this? Yeah, you can ask. Ask. Uh, sir, just I wanted to mention, I was, it was an amazing dissection for the uh, carotid. So uh, my question is, in this type of dissection, when there is maybe more than 180 degree or 270 degree adjustment, if you are planning to dissect in a pap -CA, do you always do a balloon occlusion? And if balloon occlusion is negative, or it's, uh, uh, so it's an unfavorable result, will you, again, will you still go for a dissection? Just this is my question. Yeah, no, as I said, uh, the, if there is narrowing and irregularity, that's the one you're likely to need uh, reconstruction. So for that, the uh, vascular surgeon we have done in the past, you do what you mean is the balloon occlusion test to see whether you can occlude the carotid safely. So they actually go to the circle of villus occlude and make sure that the opposite side can take over the brain function. So during surgery, if uh, the carotid you want to resect, then you can safely clamp and do a reconstruction of the carotid. That's an extremely rare situation. So, but just to know that that's when we would do it. But for the regular ones, as I said, 90, 180 contact, the carotid has normal lumen size and uh, no irregularity. I don't think you need to go into balloon occlusion. You can, you can oh, certify it. For the 360 degree, I was asking. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Well done, everybody. We are just banging on the time schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sharing my experience that as I grow in the thyroid surgery, I don't worry so much about the nerve. I worry more about the parathyroids. Um, honesty helps. Please write your documentation correctly because now we are working in a tertiary-like situation where most of you are working and you get these notes done, absolutely bookish notes, everything done correctly. You operate and you see something like this. So don't do any uh, half-hearted job. Look out straight because this is what everybody asked me. So this slide has been put up here. Uh, Rahul will recognize such kind of pictures. I do not do uh, cervical epidural anesthesia as a routine in my urban practice. This kind of a surgical technique, which is pioneered by my wife, Dr. Mrs. Vidula Kapre, is really a boon, particularly in the Chikhaldara situation. She's a master on this technique. And you can see that the patient literally walks on and walks off the table. But again, putting the record straight, it is not meant for Nakul, it is only meant for Chikhaldara and Megat, and that also under the able control of Dr. Mrs. Kapri. Now, this is the last slide I want to conclude with, is now the thyroids are coming back to ENT group. In the my days, we are sort of a uh, oncosurgeon, general surgeon, endosurgeons. But if they are coming back to the ENT people, be prepared for it, read about it, do about it, and then command the surgery rather than demanding it. Do it so diligently that the surgery will be justified in your hands. With that, I thank you all of my panelists. And if I enthuse you enough in the thyroid surgery, you are very welcome to come to the Chikaldara. Uh, before before any more conclusion, comments from the panelists. Okay, before conclusion, there are a couple of questions. Uh, they were repeatedly asking me. Yeah. Uh, put uh, two questions in the chat box. Can you finish that, sir? Which is related yes, to. Yes, yes, yes. I will take it. I will take it. There is a question here on NIFTP. And as I said, I, when I read that question, I said, I will wait for this question to be answered later on because I have been involved in this case very um, emotionally once uh, long back when this first appeared on the New York Times and the New York Times screamed, screamed and screamed and said, doctors were wrong. They were doing wrong labeling and they were putting people as cancer when they had no cancer. And that was this NIFTP. And we had one lady with a 4.5 large tumor MS one-sided, reportedly as uh, follicular CA. We operated, bilateral done. The girl was about to get married. The report broke as a malignancy. Her marriage broke. She could the, the, the boy refused to marry her because of the, the diagnosis. And then a few days later, there were slides moving from here to Mumbai to another center. 
and the diagnosis came off as NIFTP. NIFTP is a new animal on the block, which is like non-invasive follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, what's the treatment policy? Very difficult to make this diagnosis pre-operatively. This is only done post-operatively and therefore you will be in a situation where with that size of a tumor, you will end up doing a, uh, a total thyroidectomy, probably justifiably because you do not know this diagnosis beforehand. So my, my stand on this NIFTP business is, I'll go by the size, I'll go by the other risk certification criteria, and if they justify me to do a total, I will do a total, but I will quickly, hesitantly, not hesitantly, quickly, and rather very, very quickly, add as soon as I see the pathology, is to reassure the family and remove the label of carcinoma so that maybe I will not hit upon another marriage which is broken, because of my diagnosis of thyroid carcinoma. And the other question is incidentaloma on PET scan. I think this is answered, Vijay. Uh, Rahul said that the PET CT diagnosis uh, uh, incidentalomas are 30% more malignant or more probably malignant, and therefore we treat it a little bit more aggressively than the incidentaloma as detected on the other modalities of imaging light, MRI or CT. Any other questions pending, Vijay? Fine, sir. I think it's done. So uh, I thank you. my panelists and give them a, a, a last opportunity to throw questions either at each other or at me. Or if everybody is willing to go for their Sunday supper. I think there was one question about uh, post-operative hypocalcemia. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes that yes. is a difficult issue. But I think two points from that question I would raise is uh, use of calcitra, which is activated vitamin D3, D3 uh, if your calcium is low. If it is still persistently low, then we now check magnesium, which is like a cofactor for calcium. If your magnesium is deficient, then the calcium doesn't come up. So you, here we have written only uh, calcium type QID. So you have to use calcitriol, which is uh, increases the absorption very significantly of the calcium. And if it's still low, check magnesium and correct IV uh, if required. Yeah. Um, so I will sir, again get a sort of comprehensive answer on that. Is the policy which we follow? I'm sure it is followed everywhere that the post-operative hypercalcemia is classified into symptomatic and asymptomatic or biochemical or real. Now, uh, if you have the, the PTH measuring facility, it also helps. The downward trend of calcium going is worrisome, but if there is one down and then coming up again is not so worrisome. Uh, just clarification on the levels of PTH, because this was work done at my center with almost about uh, uh, 46 patients enrolled on this study, where we reportedly said, that the measurement of PTH, which the book says has to be above 10, uh, if the patient has to be prognosticated as probably will be normal. And my center, we very strongly say that any measurable amount of PTH, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, is a reasonable assurance that this patient will be normal. And we came to this conclusion because of the fact that the PTH is measured in picograms and it's a very heat sensitive hormone. So by the time you withdraw the blood, send the sample to the lab and the sample is actually being processed. If there is not the same building, I'm not saying same center, it could be same center, but another building. Even if the building is different, there is some loss of PTH during the transit. And therefore, if the PTH is measurable in any amount and the calcium is not going downwards, you can be assured that your patients will be all right and you can give them symptomatically calcium for maybe a few months and then withdraw. Uh, I think, uh, Vijay, uh, we are well over the time, but I'm happy to keep on going, but I'm sure the, the, the IOHNS people... Uh, maybe... There are more than uh, 300 delegates watching. If you want, you can say a few words about our forthcoming IOHNS conference at Nagpur. Ah, of course, of course. Thank you, Vijay. You see, we have got many more interesting topics than this. Uh, of course, thyroid will be there, but there are very, very interesting all over uh, ENT spectrum. There is implants, cochlear implant. There is reconstruction of the middle ear. There is a malignancy early, late. Then there are, of course, rhinology, right from simple septum to the most complicated skull-based surgeries performed by the best of the best people in the country. You are very welcome uh, to uh, participate. It is on 
25, 26, 27th of November. And I'm sure you'll be seeing more of us and more of these pamphlets coming through the, the emails. Uh, and uh, Dr. Samir Chaudhary is the most active guy around here. Dr. Nandu Kolwarkar, Dr. Devin Maure, Dr. Jeevan Vedi. I mean, I can host galore people who were the star awards of the 2020 AOI are back here and under their guidance, I'm very sure that it will be a big, big extravaganza. Please register early and take advantage of early bird registration also. Have I done it right, Vijay? Yes, Have sir. I left something? I think you left artificial intelligence by Vijay. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, on, uh, yeah. There is, no, there is actually, no, there is actually a talk on artificial intelligence. Uh, this talk was given by Professor Tolly, and he has got the AI being used for variety of ENT conditions and in particular for thyroid. It will be an interesting talk. Very interesting talk. So uh, on behalf of IOHNS, I would like to place my sincere thanks to this entire faculty who has joined for this live webinar discussion on this Sunday evening, sparing their time from their family for teaching and sharing your knowledge with us. And I also would like to thank the participants who are nearly 300 across India who are really encouraging us to conduct more programs. And our moderator, Dr. Madan Kapre, sir, who has a vast experience in this field, has clearly got the most possible and practical messages on this topic of holistic management of thyroid disorders from all the faculty across India. So who are key opinion leaders in this field. I would also like to place my sincere thanks to Professor MJ Paul from Belur and Saurabh Datta from Kolkata, uh, endocrine and oncosurgeons who immediately accepted our invitation for participating in this program on this Sunday evening to share their tremendous amount of experience on this thyroid management topic. So I also would like to thank GSK, especially Mr. Sundaram, Shankar and their team who are working behind this program to help spreading the knowledge, which is the main aim of Indian Academy. So those who are not members of IOHNS, I would like to welcome all to be part of IOHNS. And by becoming a member of IOHNS, you can download the membership form from our website, iohns.com and send it to us. Next program is going to be in the month of September, another weekend with different interesting topic with interdisciplinary team. And I would like to like thank the participants uh, to visit iohns.com for the update. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. It was a nice uh, uh, webinar we had and the panel discussion. Thank yes. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. In spite of the Indo Park uh, match going on, we had a good attendance. <laughs> <laughs>